Now, there are some exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. Most notably, this one called HOPA, the Housing for Older People, all right? And if you think about it, age is the single most discriminatory characteristic that we actually use, right? You got to be 16 to drive. You got to be 18 to vote. You got to be 21 to drink. You got to be 55 to get the really good menu at Denny's. So we actually do discriminate on age a lot. HOPA, which gives some communities special consideration because they are designed for older people and they must maintain a minimum standard to maintain the designation. That standard is 80% of all of the occupied units have to have at least one person that is 55 or older living in them. So you think, well, how is that an exemption? Because there could be a person whose mother has their child living with them, and maybe the child's an adult child, 30 years old, and they say, we, you can't live here. And that person is going to say, well, that's family status. You are using the fact that it's my son against me. No, they're using the fact that your son is not old enough, and under HOPA, we have that protection or exemption of allowing or requiring 80% of our occupants to be over the age of 55. So it, it does allow for some exemptions on certain areas. Now, let's talk about some definitions of this fair housing law. The first is this thing called what is a housing or what is dwelling? It is any building that is part of a building designed for occupancy. So it may not include farmland. It may not include commercial loans. It does not include uh, business loans. All right? Which makes me think, I kind of laugh sometimes that I mentioned this earlier, that it looks like it's okay to do that because the fair housing doesn't apply. <laughs> All right? What is a family? A family is one or more individuals who have not reached the age of 18 who are living with their parent or legal guardian. So that would be construed as a family. What is a disability? A disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits the quality of life or any of its major activities. It does not include the current use of a legal drug. It does protect somebody in a recovery program, and it also protects people that have are afflicted with HIV or AIDS. They are under the protected portion. Okay? Now, <clears throat> there's a question that I ask all the time, and there are some other exemptions to the fair housing. One of them that I ask is, suppose I own a rental house and a guy comes to me in a wheelchair and says, hey, Raymond, I want to rent in your property. Uh, and he's qualified. He's got a job. He's got the credit, all that. But I say, sorry, I can't rent to you. Can I do that? The answer is yes. Because one of the exemptions is a financial exemption. I could literally say, hey, dude, I would love to rent to you. But I do not have the money to build a ramp for your wheelchair, nor do I have the money to put grab bars in the bathroom and lower the desks and all of that. I could get that exemption. If, and while I've got in the square there, if that person says, you know what, dude, I'll pay for all of that myself. They have, in fact, removed that potential for an exception. So, yes, I could say I can't rent to you because I can't afford to modify the property. And they say, I'll pay for it. Okay, now I cannot say that because they have removed that exemption. There is a whole bunch of play 
stuff that goes on here that just infuriates me. For an example, you can't charge more earnest money for someone that was, may need uh, a handicap exemption than a, uh, someone who doesn't, like a wheelchair. But what you can do is charge a second earnest money because there is an added cost to move all of this stuff or replace it or modify it back to the original condition. So while the rules say I can't charge this person 500 and that person 600, I have to charge them both 500 for earnest money, but I could charge a second earnest money to the person that maybe is in a wheelchair because when they move out, I have to take out that ramp and that's going to cost more money. So while it says you can't charge more, you can charge a second one. Now, I will tell you one of the things that really makes me mad about this fair housing, and I hope this comes off as you understanding what I'm saying. It's not that I disagree with the concept. The fact is this law is what they call an effects law. It is not a burden law. It's not a proof or what they call an intent law. There does not have to be any intent in violating this law. If the effect feels like you violated the law, then you are in fact in violation. So let me give you an example, a real world example conversation that I was having with a friend of mine that you could see what I'm talking about. Do you guys remember Hussein Bolt for Jamaica? That was the fastest man alive and did crushed all the records in the Olympics and all that. So I was talking to a buddy of mine about him because we were in Jamaica. And if you've ever been to Jamaica, it's hot. <clears throat> and I was joking saying, well, you know why he ran a hundred yards because it was too dang hot to run a marathon in Jamaica. So he would just run short distances. That's what I was talking about. And I said, so because of that, he got really fast. And the buddy that I had was talking to me and he turned to me and goes, well, yeah, that's true. But you know, they are all fast. Really? What are you saying, Daryl? Are you telling me that he's fast and they're all fast because he was black? And Daryl said, oh, no, 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 not at all. What I mean was all of the sprinters, I mean, even the guy from Ireland would outrun me. That's what I meant. All those sprinters in that were fast. That is a very classic example of there was no intent on his part to make a racial comment. But I took it, and therefore my feelings were, that it was a comment. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It is not an intent law, all right? If you say something and someone else believes that you said something wrong, that could be a violation. That is the problem I have with this. You cannot ever stand in front of the administrative law judge and go, well, your honor, I did not mean to. Stop, time out, it doesn't matter. There is, this does not have to prove intent. What was the effect of your comment? That's the problem. Another good example is if you look in your book on page 359, and if you don't have one with you, let's see if I can do this. You get this poster right here. This poster is the equal opportunity poster. If you fail to post that, the assumption is you are prejudicial by nature and you are automatically fined $500 when HUD, who will shop you, comes into your real estate brokerage. So the fact is I have to tell people that I don't discriminate. And if I fail to tell them, the assumption is that I do it. I have a problem with that personally. Should be, dude, I don't discriminate. Nobody should. 
and only when you find me doing something should I found guilty. That's not how this works. If you don't prove yourself innocent, i.e. post that on the wall, <laughs> you are assumed to be guilty. Now, I will say, on the bright side, it's not a real extensive posting. You literally could print that page off out of your ebook and tape that to your wall right here, and that would be acceptable. But the failure to do it is basically, they think, admitting that you must discriminate. Because you're not saying you don't, you must, and therefore that's a fine. So that's actually a problem that I have. It's an effects law, not an intent law, and you actually have to prove yourself innocent before they find you guilty, okay? There are other exemptions to the Fair Housing Act. If the house is being sold or rented by an owner-occupied person who does not own more than three homes, they may be able to get away with a violation or two. Probably not sell, said the correct way, but I don't know really how to say it. They may be not subject to the, basically, somebody has to report them. So an owner-occupied property who does not own more than three homes at the same time. Who would own more, three, more than three residential homes at the same time? Who would ever do that? A landlord. And if they're a landlord that is their business, they should know better. That what I'm talking about here is the mom and pop who can't sell their home, so they buy their next home in Florida to retire, and they keep the one up here as a rental because they couldn't sell it. That is the novice or the mom and pop. That's who potentially could be exempt. They also make sure that there's not a real estate agent involved. If you and I get involved in the help of the sale or the lease, we need to tell them, dude, you can't do that, <laughs> all right? And at no time can you ever advertise that. Potentially, if someone comes up to my house and they say, hey, I want to buy your property, and you go, look, I don't want to sell to a Martian, I might be able to get away with that because it's owner-occupied. I don't own more than three. There's no real estate agent involved. And I didn't put in my ad no Martians, okay? That could be exemption. Now, there's other exemptions that are possible. Number three, dwellings owned by a religious organization. And number five, is private clubs. They can restrict the sale or the lease to fellow members of that religious organization or of that private club. So long as joining that religious organization or joining that private club is not restricted based on one of those seven protected classes. Okay, so for example, the Fraternal Order of Eagles, FOE, is a social club. They could own property and they would say, look, we're only selling this house to a fellow member of the FOE. If you want to buy it, just go join the social club because there are no restrictions to joining it and we'll sell it to you. That is legal. What can't happen is like the Girl Scouts owning a property and the Girl Scouts saying, hey, we only sell this to fellow Girl Scouts because that is very discriminatory. Males cannot join the Girl Scouts. That is a violation. That particular example would be a violation because not everybody can go and join that private club. They literally have to be female. That's a violation, okay? okay. 
Another exemption is what we talked about is the HOPA, the HOPA people. That is not a family violation. It's an age thing. They have to be over 55 or 80% of them have to be over the age of 55. Even though it may be your child, it is not a violation against the family. It's a violation against the age. And they have declared that under this thing called HOPA. All right? <clears throat> now, there is a second law that we deal with, and it's kind of thrown in here. It's called the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act. Now, understand that this is not really a housing act per se. It is more of a consumer and employer act, but because we, in our business of housing, deal with employees working at my company, and we deal with consumers, we get brought into the ADA, and there are two titles or articles or sections, however you want to look at it. They call them titles. There are two of them that we really need to be cognizant of. Title I covers the employer making reasonable accommodations for their employees with disability. Now, I want to stress that, reasonable accommodations. It is not absolute. There is a financial burden that maybe I cannot do. I owned a three-story building years ago in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. It did not have an elevator. Well, that is problematic in today's world. And I had an exemption because the cost to put an elevator in a building that A, didn't have one in it, and B, to dug, dig out the tunnel for the elevator pit or put it on the roof was too financially burdensome that I got an exemption from Title I of the ADA, or well, I got an Americans with Disability Act exemption, not specifically just Title I, because there's some other things. So Title I says I must provide reasonable accommodations. I can't afford to do all of it. Title III is the second one that's involved with us. This deals with the access of public goods and services by the consumer. This would be the elevator that I was just talking about. None of these people could actually go to the second floor if they were handicapped in a wheelchair because we had no elevator. The curb cut on the sidewalk that allows someone to go down the curb and back up without having to go over it, that might be a Title III issue. So those are the ADA issues, all right? So there are companies like a property management company or a real estate brokerage company that may have both of these. You've got fair housing issues because housing is our gig, right? But I have an office and people that are living in my rentals come into my office to make their monthly rent payment. I would also have Title I issues because I've got an employee sitting in there who may have a disability, so I've got to have grab bars in the bathroom. i got to have a lower desk, maybe the TTY phone. And then I've got Title III because the consumer is coming in and they need to get down the stairs or up the stairs or on the curb or special parking to get into my office to pay the rent. So there are some companies like us that may end up dealing with multiple uh both the fair housing and both the ADA, okay? Now, like Walmart, they have ADA issues, but they will, may not have fair housing. That's not their gig. They sell widgets, okay? Now, when it comes to fair housing, there are some issues that have been in place for years, and some of them, unfortunately, are still around. So the first thing I want to talk about is this thing called blockbusting. Blockbusting is when a person would induce a panic sale. 
and sometimes you hear the word called panic selling, all right? Panic selling is when you create some sort of panic so that the seller wants to get out. A good example might be is, hey, man, did you hear the airport? Yeah, the airport bought your neighbor's house, and your house is going to lose value because the airport's going to be right in your backyard. That would be panic selling. If you used one of the protected classes for panic selling, the special term they used for that was called blockbusting. In the 50s, they called this the white flight. People were going into uh, neighborhoods and going, hey, man, the so-and-so people are going to be moving in. That's going to lower the value of your house. You probably should move out right now. And, oh, by the way, I happen to have cash on me to buy the property. So it was almost always money incentive driven, but it was an illegal form of panic selling called blockbusting. Steering is when you channel a home buyer towards an area or away from an area based on one of those seven protected classes. Even if they ask and you think you're right. I had a client that came in to me and said, hey, look, <clears throat> I don't speak English. I want to live in an area that is Hispanic. Now, I'm bilingual. I speak Spanish. So I was talking to him and he said, I want to live with the other English or Spanish speaking people. So I told him where we're going to go. I said, great, we need to go to this area of town. This was my, believe it or not, my second day with my license. So it's been a long, long time ago. He said, okay, I want to go get my wife. We'll come back and talk to you. So when he left, my managing broker at the time stepped up and goes, Raymond, what are you doing? I said, well, I've got a client and he wants to go find property. He's like, no, dude, you're steering. I said, but he asked me, I don't care you used one of the seven protected classes, namely his national origin and or his race, to guide him towards an area. So when this guy came back in, he's like, hola, I'm like, como te va? He is, he, Andy came out and said, look, we can't do this. You need to go to the Hispanic consulate and figure out and do your own statistics. So a couple weeks later, he came back in and said, hey, I want to I want to go to this area of the city. And I turned to my boss and went, ta-da, because it was the area that I named. But the fact is, he gave me now a geographic region, which we can discriminate on. People do that all the time. I want to live in the water. I want to live on the north side. What I did was try to steer him towards a specific area based on my intellect, and that is called steering. And I know what you're thinking, even if you're trying to help, all right? So we told him, dude, you go do your own statistics, do your own study, do your own research, come back and tell me where, which is exactly what happened. Now, here's another one that I have trouble with. The advertising law. The advertising law is a problem. Once again, I am going to read something out of the book that says uh, advertising in a Korean language newspaper only tends to discriminate against non-Koreans. Well, duh. So the first question of the day is, what's the official language of the United States? Somebody tell me. Go ahead, type it in the text, send me an email, and I'll tell you right now. There is none. We don't have one. The United States does not have an official language. It just so happens that most of the people that landed here first spoke English, therefore we spoke, speak English. But it is not our official language. So, in that example, advertising in a language indicates a preference or a limitation that's discriminatory against one population or another, and you're using that target to exclude others. I personally know, personally, at least six people that don't speak English. 
So even if I put an ad in the yard in English, it technically violates this rule. You cannot not violate this rule, all right? I know there's an agent on the west side of Indianapolis who puts all her stuff in the uh, Spanish language. I get what she's doing. She is helping a underserved community. Or on the south side in the Burmese language. I've seen for sale signs in Burmese. I get what they're doing. I understand the warm and fuzzy of trying to help one of these, what Wells Fargo calls them, the emerging markets, the Indian market, the Burmese market, and the Hispanic market. That's what Wells Fargo calls their emerging markets. I get it. However, based on the fact of what this literally says, it is actually a violation of the fair housing. Even doing it in English technically violates this rule because there are people that would be excluded because they do not speak that language. So once again, this is one of those where it's a warm fuzzy and we all feel good by saying, well, we don't discriminate, but technically under this definition you do. Unless you're putting the ad in the German newspaper, the Hispanic newspaper, the Japanese newspaper, the English newspaper, all of the languages, which we know is asinine that you can't even come close to doing, technically would violate this rule. When an appraiser appraises property, he cannot use one of those protected classes to influence the value of the property. He can't say, well, you know, if this would have been in this neighborhood, it would have been a hundred grand more. This next one, actually, uh, I think Wells Fargo just got caught with this several years ago. It's called redlining. And literally what would happen is, let's uh, clear this out so we can see. Redlining is where they would take a map, literally with a red marker, and go, okay, do not do loans inside of that circle because of the so-and-so people or because of the so-and-so issues or whatever. That would be redlining. And a lot of insurance companies have tried this and a lot of mortgage companies have said, hey, people inside of that red line don't have a high enough credit score, so do not make loans to them. That is a huge violation. Matter of fact, in the lending world, there's actually a second violation called reverse redlining where you would target specifically people in here because they have no other choice. So what they were doing was actually adding a bunch of fees to those loans just to make a whole bunch of money because the people inside of that red line had no other choice. So lenders actually had a thing called reverse redlining as well, all right? Letter F is exactly what I was mentioning earlier. This is an effects law that there could be some discrimination even without the intent to do that. So there is an effects law that gets applied, but the reality is it's not an intent rule. People are worried about terrorism now, and they think, you know, there's a certain group out there that are terrors, terrorists. So you've got to be careful that you cannot, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, where you just automatically assume that they are. Gee whiz, I just lost my mind. Uh, predict that because they are of a certain nationality, they are also going to be terrorists. So you got to make sure you don't violate any of the fair housing laws. All right. Now, if there is a violation or there is a assumed violation, a consumer can make a complaint and they would make the complaint to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And they have to make that complaint within one year of the act. All right? 
So they have to complain. If they believe there's a violation, they have to complain within one year. Now, what happens is HUD will investigate to see if there is a violation. And the very first thing they will do in this investigation is this thing called conciliation. Conciliation is where both parties hug and make up and move on. You know, this is where now you can kind of explain that lack of intent. So HUD would bring both parties in and they're going to go, hey, look, Daryl, you made this comment that seems racist. What are you talking about? And he's like, no, 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 no. I didn't mean that all black people were fast. I meant that all the sprinters were fast in the Olympics. And I, as the one that felt the violation, go, okay, I agree with that. I believe he was probably not. That would be conciliation. We both agree. And HUD says, okay, hug and make up and move on out. That would be the first attempt is to resolve it through conciliation. Now, if they determine that conciliation, if I said, look, dude, I don't think that's what he meant. He's lying to you. I really think he's racist. Then we would go in front of this thing called the ALJ. The ALJ, in my opinion, is the worst judge in the world because they are the judge, the jury, and the executioner all in one person. It is one person. Now, EPA uses ALJs. Um, what's the other one that uses ALJs? The uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, if there's an OSHA violation. So it's one person that will come in and he will listen to both sides of the party uh, parties and he will make a decision if there's a violation and he will actually award damages or impose the civil penalties. He is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Now, <clears throat> there, somebody has told me that these three questions were on the exam. I have a hard time believing that because I will tell you, I have been teaching this course now 20 years. And way back a long time ago, the very first one, the first offense was only 11,000. I remember that. Now they're saying it's 21,000. I don't see why we would need to memorize that, but someone suggested that, not me. First offense, 21,633. Second offense is 54,157. And then the third offense is up to, look at this, 100 grand or, or potentially and seven years in jail. Dude, if you have been found guilty three times of violating the Fair Housing Act, you better rethink your strategy on what business you're in to begin with, okay? So just the thing that I like to notice is just notice that the penalties escalate. It's not like double for the second one or double for the third one. You know, it is a huge amount. Now, if there is a case that is heard based on the Civil Rights Act of 19, or 1866. Which class is that? The Civil Rights Act of 1866? That is race. That goes directly to federal court. Federal court. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. And if you go to federal court, those damages can result in, I love this word right here, unlimited punitive damages. Once again, what does punitive mean? It's a punishment. You are being punished for doing this. Unlimited. You could be punished $20 million as a fine or a fee if you violate the Civil Rights Act of 1866, if you violate the race card right here, that would go straight to federal court. You better be careful. They do not play with this. Now, I've told you these are the federal laws. 
However, every state has a state level. Some states even actually have a municipal level, all right, of fair housing laws. If the HUD has a complaint to look at, they will push it down to the state level. And the state must have substantially equivalent laws. That's what I was saying. All states have to be at least as restrictive as the feds. They can be more, but typically they are uh, uh, the least. <clears throat> if there are threats of violence against you, the fair housing also protects you for that. You can adjoin your client's lawsuit. So think about this. As a white male, I can actually file a racial discrimination lawsuit if my client filed one. If I had a client that felt like they were discriminated based on race, so he filed a fair housing lawsuit, because I am an extension of my client, I am part of him, and I got harmed because, hey, he didn't buy, I didn't earn the commission, I can actually file with him as part of him. So I could, in fact, file a racial discrimination case. Now, what does this mean for you guys? Well, it could mean a whole bunch of things. You theoretically could lose your license out of the gate. You could get fined a huge penalty. Remember, unlimited. You could have serious repercussions to your reputation. People may not use you anymore. Not only could you, maybe you didn't use your license, but people now believe that you are, you know, a racist individual or whatever and won't use you. So there are a whole bunch of implications that could happen to you because of this. So please be careful when dealing with this. This is not something they joke around with. All right, so that's fair housing. There are the seven protected classes. There are some exemptions in there, so make sure you understand what could be exempted from that fair housing. Also, there are some illegal activities that we discussed, like the blockbusting and panic selling and redlining, and I guarantee that you guys are going to need to know the Civil Rights Act of 1866 brought in race. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 brought in these other three. Then the Community Housing and Community Development Act brought in sex. Then the amendments of 88 brought in the disability and familial status. Guarantee you're going to need to know which law brought in which protected class. All right. I suggest down here, you guys do some more uh, practice questions at the bottom of this online section. There are also questions in the back of your ebook that can help you. And if you have further questions, I'm here. This is what you're paying me for. All right. Feel free to reach out to me at Raymond at realuniversity.com. I will catch up with you on the next chapter. See ya.